Let's talk about Joss. Bitch. So, here we are again. I almost feel like I could compile the videos I've made about problematic creators in general, J.K. Rowling in specific, Gareth Roberts, and now Joss Whedon, and call the whole thing, well, here we are again. Because, let's be very honest, this is going to keep happening. Probably into the foreseeable future. But I'll come back to that. So... Joss Whedon, stuff has come out about him in specific, uh, and he's kind of been in not too many people's good graces lately anyways. I'll give some context on that in a minute. But some specifics came out uh, that really, speaking personally, is kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. I've been drifting away from Whedon's work, which has meant a lot to me in the past. I've been drifting away from it over time. So honestly, it's a little bit less like the shoe dropped than the shoe has been falling in slow motion for a couple of years and it has finally impacted the ground. So context. Let's start with what has gone on up to this point. Because I did say straw that broke the camel's back, which would imply that stuff had been going on or at least been in you know, in the mix prior to this. So I think in a lot of ways, and some people might be able to point to earlier stuff, but I think for most of us, the first red flag was following his divorce when his ex-wife made some statements that really brought into question the image that Whedon had built for himself. Um, and made some, without doing, without being specific and without naming names, made some very unpleasant uh, inferences about how he treats um, the people underneath him. More recently, uh, Ray Fisher, who had portrayed Cyborg in the Justice League film, he made some accusations in regards to the work environment that Whedon fostered when he came in to take over the shoot from Zack Snyder. And it, yeah, it wasn't pleasant in terms of how he treated other people and just fostered a very hostile working environment. Ray Fisher spoke out about that. There was a, it might even be still ongoing, formal investigation at Warner Brothers about that. Uh, Ray Fisher is now no longer involved in the Justice League movies. Uh, and most likely is not involved because he spoke out about that um, and wasn't prepared to retract his statements. So that had happened. And the thing is, up to this point, I think a fair number of us, if not making flat-out excuses, were softening things in our minds. Um, at least to some degree, because, you know, the first thing is like, well, it's, it's his ex-wife, you know, most breakups aren't pleasant. And then with what happened on with Justice League, there was already a lot of controversy uh, around that. It's questionable, like how nice it would have been for him to even come in and work on it. Was he getting resistance from the people who saw what he was changing in terms of it not being what Snyder had wanted? Who knows? And I'm not saying that any of that was likely. I'm saying those were the kinds of things that I think a fair number of us were at least muddying the waters with. But now Charisma Carpenter, who played Cordelia Chase in Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel, has spoken out and made a statement. And I am not going to read it in its entirety. I would encourage you to do so. I've linked to it down in the description. I am, however, going to summarize. And a lot of what she says, for anyone who's been paying attention to um, Buffy for a while, a lot of 
us kind of suspected this. Charisma Carpenter describes a toxic, harassing work environment, just in general. And in specific, she cites Joss's reaction to her becoming pregnant during the filming of the fourth season of Angel. And him asking her questions like, are you going to keep it? Which is an atrocious thing to ask a woman who is not your partner and you have no business asking her anything about what she plans to do. He would call her fat while she was four months pregnant and she was uh, removed and written out of the show, effectively fired, shortly after she gave birth in real life. Now, as I said, a lot of us had kind of suspected a bunch of this because it was a known factor that Charisma Carpenter's pregnancy wasn't planned. They had to do a lot of rewrites for the season to accommodate for it, and she did more or less leave the show, barring one later appearance after that. But nothing had ever really been confirmed, and in fact, some of the statements she'd made would seem to indicate, well, maybe it wasn't all that. Which is something she addressed in her statement and is the one part I am actually going to read. Despite the harassment, part of me still sought his validation. I made excuses for his behavior and repressed my own pain. I have even stated publicly at conventions that I'd work with him again. Only recently, after years of therapy and a wake-up call from the Time's Up movement, do I understand the complexities of this demoralized thinking. It is impossible to understand the psyche without enduring the abuse. Our society and industry vilified the victims and glorified the abusers for their accomplishments. The onus is on the abused with an expectation to accept and adapt to be employable. No accountability on the transgressor who sails on unscathed, unrepentant, remorseless. And I need to stress that this statement, in addition to the things I've already laid out, does not exist in isolation. Amber Benson who portrayed Tara on Buffy, has not released a, as detailed a statement, but has verified that the work environment was toxic. And there was also something said by James Marsters, who played Spike, uh, about the middle of last year. He was on a podcast, uh, Michael Rosenbaum's podcast, and he talked about an incident where Joss got very frustrated. This was... Uh, back in season two of Buffy, when Spike was first introduced, Joss was very frustrated how well the character was being received because he hadn't wanted another long-term, you know, people think he's hot vampire. He didn't want that. His plan was to always kill Spike. And he pushed Marsters against the wall and said, I don't care how popular you are, you're dead. And Marsters made clear in that interview that he wasn't, this wasn't a joking around, jovial thing. Oh, (laughs) this isn't what I wanted. Oh, well, that he was taking out his anger on the actor. Now, there's a phrase that I want people to keep in mind, because I suspect some of you, if not uh, prepared to express the thought, have at least had the thought, well, aren't some of these situations in which frustration from Whedon would be understandable? If he had a whole season planned out and one of the actors got pregnant and he couldn't do the season the way way he wanted, wouldn't that justifiably make him angry? If things got sent off the rails because a character was popular in a way he hadn't planned, wouldn't that do the thing? When he was brought on to Justice League to work on a film that he had a weird sort of relationship with and couldn't truly do his own thing with, wouldn't that be frustrating? Yes. Yes to all of that. But here's what I want you to remember. You can't help your gut emotional reaction. You can't help your first thought. He couldn't help the fact that he felt anger. What he can help, what you can help, what everyone has the capability of helping is how they respond and react to that thought. The fact that he felt anger, you know what? I probably would have too. But the fact that he took it out on the actors and made a hostile work environment where people dreaded speaking out about how he was treating them because they knew that it would make them unemployable as actors. This is not a case of he got news, got angry, shouted for three seconds, then went, okay, uh, uh, calm down. And Sarah Michelle Gellar 
also issued a very short statement. She didn't add any um, new information. She didn't tell her own story. In fact, indicated that she didn't intend to. However, she also made it clear that she is distancing herself from Joss and is standing with the abused. So where does this leave us? Because this is a bit different from the other times that I have discussed problematic creators. Because when I did that video, I very deliberately chose to focus on people who had what I described as deplorable beliefs. And I touched on but did not dwell on those who commit deplorable actions. I believe what I said at the time was something to the effect of, look, if somebody does a thing and that's largely going to depend on your own personal ick factor and what it takes to sort of set you off and make you go, Ugh. Uh, as opposed to someone's beliefs, which was what I wanted to tackle in that video. This is kind of a bit of a middle ground here because this is largely about Whedon's actions, things he did, as opposed to things that he actively believes, so far as we know. I mean, aside from the fact that he seemed to believe it was okay for him to do this. That's not what I'm talking about, though. But at the same time, it does bear some resemblance to the issues I brought up in that video in that this has clearly been an ongoing thing. This isn't something that just happened once. We are getting stories now from earlier in his career with Buffy the Vampire Slayer, early into Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We're getting stories from season two of that show. And then we are having other people come out and speak and everyone is lining up. The stories match. They are consistent. And then we look at Ray Fisher and the behavior that he described is 100% consistent. So while this is a case of actions, they have, by all indications, been ongoing. He never got better. Because he didn't have to. Charisma Carpenter actually said in her statement that the reason she was finally speaking out was because of Ray Fisher. And she wanted to stand beside him and explain that he was not alone in the abuse that he suffered at the hands of Jaws. And this thing that she said that the abusers are praised for their accomplishments is absolutely correct. Because he was successful, because he had initially a successful TV show and then multiple successful TV shows and then a successful film career, because he continued to make money, then he was never going to answer for these things. Why would the studios or whoever move against him. He's making the money. There's a phrase that I think, you know, we're all taught, uh, or at least we pick up. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. The idea being that if you talk up about a problem, it will be addressed. Oftentimes, the reality is the squeaky wheel is the wheel that gets replaced. You bring up the problem and you are at fault for saying that something's wrong. The fault lies not with who caused the problem. The fault lies with the person who pointed it out because they remove the inability for the people who write the paychecks to ignore it. The minute somebody says it, they have to deal with it. And they would much rather punish the person who spoke out than punish the person who caused the issue. And it's not even a question of whether or not it is credible. That's never the issue. It is always a financial calculus. Is it worse for us to get rid of, is it worse for us financially to get rid of the person making waves or the person who they're accusing. And they nearly always will get rid of the squeaky wheel. The thing to remember at this point is we are not dealing with an isolated incident. We are dealing with 
a pattern of behavior, a pattern that has been supported and backed up and validated by multiple people from multiple settings over multiple years. And all the stories line up. So unless you're going to try and spin some elaborate conspiracy narrative, and please don't, I'm asking you politely to please not, then we have to grapple with a new name on the is it still okay to enjoy their work pile. And as I've said before, the only person who can answer that question as to whether or not you can comfortably take in Whedon's previous work is you. You're the only one who can answer that. I can't answer that for you because you are going to have to decide for yourself how much am I able to reclaim these works for me so that it doesn't feel tainted by him. I find myself in a very, ultimately a very similar situation with how I felt about J.K. Rowling. I already own Buffy and Angel. I own all seasons. I don't intend to get rid of those. I mean, I'm wearing a Buffy shirt, which I probably won't wear again for a very long time. I don't have an interest anymore in partaking in anything he has had a part in that I haven't already seen, that I don't already have my own experience of. I will not be watching The Nevers when it premieres on HBO, which people are going to point out he's not actually the showrunner anymore. I will point out that he created it. He He was the director. He was there for the filming of it. It was shot over this past summer. He didn't leave the project until I think it was November, which means that he was very heavily involved all the way through. I was wavering back and forth on whether or not I'd watch that one. Now I I definitely won't. And while I don't mean to get uh, overly indulgent in terms of speculation, it wouldn't surprise me if part of the reason he dropped out of that show was because things kind of had been coming to a head in terms of people talking about their work experiences with him. And if he saw the show through to the end, he was going to have to do press junkets. He was going to have to sit down in front of cameras with reporters, some of whom were going to ask about this. It wouldn't shock me if at least part of his leaving was to get out of the spotlight as much as he could. I don't know that. And it's it's distinctly possible that maybe it was just creative differences. Or, honestly, maybe HBO asked him to leave. Maybe they saw the flood coming and said, we want your name off this, please. And he agreed to that, or who knows. Official word is creative differences. But regardless, I don't intend to watch that. I also personally will not be discussing any of Whedon's work in future on this show. I don't think I'm going to unlist the videos I already have up, which isn't much. It was a couple of lists for Buffy and Angel, uh, respectively. But I don't plan to tackle anything new along those lines. But I'm not going to judge people who still want to talk about this stuff. It is my hope that anyone who does will not ignore and make excuses for what we are learning. That they will acknowledge it. And if they wish to engage with the work in a way that is not uh, a conversation about the person who created it, I hope that they will at least acknowledge that that is what they're doing instead of just burying their heads in the sand and pretending that nothing happened. Because burying your head in the sand and pretending that nothing happened is the kind of behavior that has enabled him to get away with behaving like this for 
decades. And as I said at the start, we're going to keep seeing this. Because the system is designed to protect the people who make the money. It disincentivizes anyone who answers to them from ever speaking up because they know that they are not worth as much money. So it's not in their interest to speak up. That's the consistent pattern. We end up, when somebody finally is able to break surface, we end up with other people coming out and saying, I'm sorry I didn't say anything before. And I don't blame them for not saying anything before. The system's rigged against them. And it is set up to enable people to keep doing whatever they think they can get away with as long as they're profitable. So if I could have a a total left-wing SJW moment for a hot second, it's funny to me that the uh, right-wing media is always so fond of talking about the liberal bastion that is uh, Hollywood when a lot of the rot at the heart of Hollywood in terms of the horrible things that people at the top do is enabled by the exact same capitalistic system that enables it to happen anywhere else. If you're in power and or make money for the people who are in power, you get a pass for a while. You get a pass for long enough that you can keep hurting people. And that's not a Hollywood issue. That's a capitalism issue. But I I think I've uh, shown my colors enough on that note. Joss Whedon. Another name on the pile. Hopefully last time I'll be talking about him. But we'll see. I don't plan to, like, keep up to date. Um... The only reason I made this is because this became the line in the sand for me, where I just, I can't anymore. And when I hit that point, I usually, it usually means I have something I need to say. But I don't have any interest in engaging in an ongoing morbid uh, watching of whatever else comes out. I'll keep tabs on it, but I'm not going to keep talking about it. Unless something happens that changes my position, I've said my piece. What are your thoughts or feelings on this? Please keep them respectful and please do your best to avoid personal attacks, especially against the people who were abused. I will block people off my comments very, very quickly for that. But as long as you can keep that under control, drop something down in the comments and let's talk about it. There's also all the usual stuff, social media links down below, links to um, Charisma Carpenter's statement, as I said, if you wish to read the whole thing. But you also don't have to. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not that controlling. Because you are the council, and I only run the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.